If you'll open up to Acts chapter 15, I was told a really funny joke this morning. Eleanor, don't give it away. What is Einstein's favorite candy? Smarties. Smarties. Yes. I thought that was pretty good. I got another story for you. A guy from named Edward Scheichen, uh, who became uh, one of the world's most renowned photographers. He almost gave up on the day where he shot his first pictures. At 16, the young man bought a camera and took 50 pictures. Only one turned out, a portrait of his sister at the piano. Edward's father thought that it was a poor showing. His mother, however, insisted that the photograph of his sister was so beautiful that it more than compensated for the 49 failures. Her encouragement convinced the youngster to stick with his new hobby. He stayed with it for the rest of his life, but it had been a close call. What tipped the scales? The vision to spot excellence in the midst of a lot of failure. Have you ever wanted to give up on something? You just get done, you're tired, doesn't make sense anymore, not interested. Maybe there's a new shiny object on the horizon, it's caught your attention. You're almost ready to be done, just kind of like our young man who just about gave up taking pictures. Many of us have had our ups and downs in life, and one minute everything is going our way. And the next we see nothing but failure. And the older we get, the more we recognize just how funny life can be. As we're going through the book of Acts, we've seen time and time again how Satan has been doing his very best to knock down the church. Have you felt Satan trying to knock you down this week? Do you notice Satan is working? He's knocking on your door. He's trying to get you to answer the door. Satan is out there. He's alive and he's active. Are you noticing this in your life? Starting back at the giving of the Spirit, the first comment was that Peter was drunk. Remember that? The giving of the Holy Spirit would get this party started, and all of a sudden they're accusing him of being drunk. Satan is already pounding on day one, minute one. And now even in Acts 15, we see, trying, we see Satan trying to pervert the message of the gospel with the need for circumcision. We looked at that last week at the Jerusalem Council. Satan is doing his very best to pervert the gospel, to change the gospel, to get you to believe in anything but the gospel. Satan is doing everything he can. So what's going to happen now that the Jerusalem Council is over? Will the churches accept the outcome? Will there be need for more debate? Or will the church gladly accept the outcome of the council and find themselves strengthened in the faith? Sometimes when you go through hard times, should make you better. Should strengthen your resolve. It should make you excited to keep moving forward. And that's the title of today's message. Keep moving forward. Today, as we go through Acts chapter 15, verses 30 through chapter 16 and verse 5, God wants you to see the strengthening of the church. In fact, as we go through this, you're going to see Paul start to embark on the second missionary journey. This Jerusalem council has not wiped out the church. Satan, in spite of his best efforts, has not knocked out the church. The people are still active. They're still going. We're going to see some more hiccups along the road, but the church is going to keep moving forward. In spite of all the efforts of Satan to knock it down, God wants you to see the strengthening of the church. There's three ways we see the church be strengthened in this particular section. First way. Verses 30 through 35, we can, we can be strengthened by conversation. No, I'm sorry, by, con, yeah, conversation. I spelled it wrong, sorry. See, Satan's even trying to knock this down. Can you believe that? Second way, verses 36 through 41, we can be strengthened by contention. That one might be a tougher pill to swallow, but believe me, we can be strengthened by contention. And third way, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 16, we can be strengthened by conversion. So let's start to look at this. Chapter 15, starting in verse 30. Let's read these few verses here. 
So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many also. We can be strengthened by the conversation. Isn't it nice when you see somebody and you just get to talk to them and you just feel your soul strengthened? You don't feel alone anymore. You know, you're not out there by yourself. Casey, it was great to see you at the store the other day. As soon as I saw you and as soon as I recognized Casey, I felt about this big. You notice he's a little different today? This brother surprised me at the store. I'm just stocking the bread. I'm doing some stuff, stickering some stuff. And I try to be nice to people. I try to have a pretty positive, happy-go-lucky attitude, even, even at work. I know, right? And this guy pops around the corner. Hi, how you doing? You know. Oh, that's Casey. Oh, well, hello, sir. <laughs> Didn't quite recognize you, sir. But you know what? When you see somebody like that and you start to have a conversation, and you're talking and you just, you know, my day was a lot better. Not that it was bad, but when you have a good conversation with somebody and you see somebody that you like and you have that kind of conversation, isn't your day just a little bit better, guys? Just to get to see a familiar face and have a little conversation. And that's what these guys are up to. They were going into a situation where they did not know what was going to happen. It says when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. So who's the they? Well, these people from the Jerusalem council, we got Paul, we got Barnabas, we got Judas, not Iscariot, we got Silas. We got these guys who've been given this letter, recommendation or whatever conclusion they came up with from the Jerusalem council. Now they get to start spreading the word and they're probably thinking to themselves, I hope they like what I'm about to say. They came to Antioch and when they gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter, probably with bated breath. I hope this is everything it's supposed to be. I hope this doesn't cause any more problems. I hope this settles the matter. I hope everything's going to be okay. You ever start to feel this way when you're talking to somebody? And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Woo, the anxiety's gone. The, the feeling, the good feeling is back. They rejoiced over its encouragement. They probably talked about it. I'm sure Paul and Barnabas and whoever explained, this is what's going on. This is what happened. And they had this conversation. And they were encouraged by it. Now, Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So they were encouraged, and they had this opportunity to be strengthened. Satan had the opportunity to knock these people down, to take away something from the church. But the Jerusalem council, the people there, stood up for what was right, came to a good, solid conclusion. They sent the people out with the message, and they were all encouraged by it. That conversation meant something. They stayed there for a time. And they sent, were sent back with greeting from the brethren to the apostles. So, all right, so we have this conversation. We understand what the Jerusalem Council brought and what salvation is truly meant to be and how this is supposed to happen. And it's not with circumcision, by the way. So they went back to Jerusalem, back to the apostles, back to, the, back to those guys, and they got to report what was going on. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. That's fine. I guess he can do that. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch. I guess they can do that. Teaching, preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Gosh, what could have been a death blow with this circumcision and keeping the commandments business, what could have been something really bad, has turned into something really beautiful. And they got to have these conversations and they got to talk about it and they got to come to some conclusions. You ever have something go on with your spouse and you're just kind of at this contention and maybe you're button heads, maybe you're not. And when you actually finally get to sit down and you get to talk about it and you get to resolve whatever's going on. Not that Amy and I ever have any problems. But when we do... When we get done talking about it and we get to resolving it, 
I don't know about her, I guess I can't speak for her, but I feel closer as a result of the conversation. We as believers can be strengthened in the Lord as a result of conversation. You know, if there's ever anything that you need to talk about, if there's anything going on in your life and you're wondering if this is from Satan, are you wondering if this is from the Lord, what's going on here, why are these people doing this, and you need someone to talk to, I'm not hard to find if you want to talk to me. Can't speak for anybody else here, but if you want to talk to me, I'm not hard to find. Shoot, Casey found me at the store the other day. I'm not hard to find. If you need someone to talk to, you're not alone. You have somebody who loves you, cares about you, and wants you to do well. If you need somebody to talk to, just pick up the phone. I'm not hard to find. Sometimes in the midst of that conversation, there's healing, there's comfort, there's encouragement. And that's what they found there in Antioch. What could have been really bad was actually really awesome. And they were encouraged and they were strengthened by the conversation. And they kept moving forward with the mission of the church, with the mission that God had given them. They kept moving forward. Forward, which is one of the things that we struggle with as people. Something like this will happen and we're anxious about it. The anxiety goes whoop through the roof. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. And all of a sudden we stop everything and we just shut her down. These folks kept moving forward. But that's not the only way we see the church be strengthened here. As we get to verse 36, it goes a little something like this. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted they should not take him with them, the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by their brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. We can be strengthened by contention. Now, when I was first studying this, first reading this, I'm thinking to myself, oh, dearly beloved, what do you say about this? We have good, solid, strong pillars in the church, strong men here, manly men, and they're fighting like unbelievers. I don't know. Aren't we all just always just supposed to get along? And we got these two fighting. You just want to smack them upside the head. Stop fighting, you two. Get the spray bottle out. Knock it off. Can you be strengthened via contention. You know, it really helps you to understand what's important, what's valuable. And these two guys, in spite of their contention, held in mind the perspective that was necessary for their mission. They didn't let the contention get in the way of pursuing the mission. Their perspective was held clear in spite of the contention. In other words, if you have a contention with someone, are you man enough? Are you strong enough? Can you stand up tall enough? And in spite of the contention, can you both recognize the value of the mission before you so that you can both keep moving forward in spite of it? That takes a lot of emotional intelligence. You got to be pretty grown up to handle that one. Because most people, as you've seen in the workplace, how many of your families are kind of broken as a result of contention? Most of us do not handle contention very well. We say, well, if they're going to be like that, and you know, I haven't seen them in five years. That's how most of us handle contention. Not everybody. I hope we're a little stronger than that, but I'm sure you know somebody in your world that handles contention like that. Maybe you've done it in the past, maybe not this last year. 
But when you're contending with somebody, can you hold the value of the mission up very high enough to say that even though we're having a contention, the value of our mission is higher and greater than the contention we're having. Let us both move forward in our own ways to carry out the mission and the work that God has for both of us. And instead of just having one team go out now, now we have two teams going out to do the work of the Lord. Satan was going to try to get these two guys to fight like cats and dogs and to derail them from the mission that God had them to do. And instead, God is able to take their contention and now double the effort. Take that, Satan. How do you like me now? Do you have the emotional capacity to handle contention like that? Many people in this world do not. But as believers, we ought to have that kind of maturity within our very soul because of the spirit given to us to be able to handle contention in a mature and godly way. And that it does not distract us from what the mission is that God has bestowed upon us. And every one of our missions are different. And a lot of us have more than one mission. Maybe your mission is to your spouse. Now you have a fight with your spouse. Well, if that's how you're going to be, I'm out of here. We've probably all said that. Don't be distracted from the work that God has for you. Contention can bring about some strength. Do you know what happens when you reconcile? You're usually stronger. You're usually stronger than the other. No, that does, that's not my advertisement to go get in a fight with your spouse this afternoon. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. That's not always. <laughs> but it would be foolish to think that it's never going to happen. And when it does happen, recognize that if you keep your eye on the prize, you both can be strengthened as a result. But you've got to keep your eye on the prize. The prize isn't your happiness, by the way. The prize isn't more money. What's the prize in the midst of a relationship like that? It's growing closer to Jesus together. It's taking care of each other like God intended. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why Barnabas wanted John Mark, and it doesn't tell us why John Mark left them in Pamphylia. There's some debate about what's going on here. Should Barnabas have taken him? Doesn't really say, unfortunately. I mean, we're left to speculate. And as fun as it is to speculate in the Bible, and believe me, we can speculate all afternoon about all kinds of things in the Bible, it doesn't really say, unfortunately. But what we do know is that Barnabas is going to take Mark and Paul is going to pick Silas. And now we have two teams instead of one that are going to go out and do the work of the ministry. When I was telling Amy... I, was, I gave her a little sneak peek at the, at the sermon this morning. And so we were watching a TV show this morning called Heartland. I don't know if anybody watches this show or not about horses and stuff. And anyway, we were, Amy told me one time that as she's watching Heartland, there's a couple of characters, you know, Jack and Amy and Ty. There's a few of these characters that when it's their time on, on scene, it's really good to watch. And then there's some other characters, Georgie, and I don't even know who some of these, Lou, some of these other characters. You're like, eh. And you just want to know more about Amy and Todd. You know, you want to know more about Jack. Well, as we go through the book of Acts, I don't know if you've read past chapter 16 or not, but as you go past chapter 16, you're going to recognize that the author, whose name is what, by the way? Luke, Luke, Luke doesn't mention Barnabas anymore. Luke doesn't mention John anymore. He's not really going to mention Peter. I mean, many of these characters that have been really strong pillars at this point, Barnabas, Peter, some of these other guys, 
Remember we had an election or of sorts early on in the book of Acts for a 12th apostle? Have we even met him yet? You know, some of these people that you think are going to be pillars of the faith. You know, if you think of this as a show, the author is going to move on to some other interesting characters. As we go on past chapter 16, somebody's going to take center stage. That's Paul. We're going to find out what Paul does. What's Paul doing? Where's Paul going? Who's Paul with? What's going on with Paul? What's Paul saying? What's Paul's message? On and on with Paul, 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 Paul. Where's Barnabas? Where's John Mark? We're going to meet people that Paul meets. For example, Timothy. Paul's going to write the letters. Paul, 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 Paul. Now, I don't think that this is necessarily meant to mean that Barnabas is off the radar. I don't think that it means that what Mark is doing is bad. But the author, Luke, has determined that we're now going to follow the life of Paul. And that's not so bad. Not everybody is meant to be Paul. Are you Paul or are you a Barnabas? I tell you what, as I tend to think about my life, I'm probably much more of a Barnabas than a Paul. That's not bad, guys. There's nothing wrong with not being Paul. It's okay to be second fiddle. It's okay to be third fiddle. It's okay to not be the one that everybody talks about. It's okay to not be the one that we focus on from Acts chapter 16 through to the end. It's okay to be the one that didn't write 13 books of the New Testament. Everybody wants to be Paul. Guys, let me tell you something real clear. It's okay to not be Paul. It's okay to run the race that God wants you to run. Paul ran the race that God wanted him to run, and we praise God for that. And you know what? I'm going to praise God for you when you run the race that God wants you to run. And it might not be in the spotlight like Paul. Does that mean that what you're doing is bad? No. Do not give up on yourself if you're not playing first fiddle. Do not give up on the work that God wants you to do if you're the one who doesn't get all the glory, the spotlight, the accolades, the preeminence. It's okay to play second fiddle to the Pauls of the world. Don't give up and keep moving forward. Because God has a plan for you and what he wants you to do. And now you need to do it no matter what it is. So we can be strengthened by conversation. We can be strengthened by contention, believe it or not. But you know what? We can also be strengthened by conversion. As we get to chapter 16, Verses 1 through 5 goes a little something like this. And then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. He took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them to the decrees to keep, which was determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. We can be strengthened by conversion. One of the number one ways that I find myself over the course of my 20-some years of Christian experience, some of the highest highs in my life have come when I've seen People get saved. Jeff, I'm never going to forget yours. Have you ever had the privilege, the opportunity, the majesty to see somebody go one minute, they're an unbeliever, and you're talking to them. They accept Jesus as their Savior, and now they're born again. Have you ever had the absolutely distinct pleasure of having that happen in your life, you you never forget them. There are a lot of things you forget in life. Believe me, as I get older, they, that number grows and grows. But there are a lot of things you don't forget in life. 
Watching people accept Christ is one of them. Your conversion, when you accepted Christ, ought to be one of them. We can be strengthened by conversion. Paul finds this young man, Timothy, new believer. He's well spoken of. He's got a lot of pure potential. And Paul picks up on this. He gets him circumcised, which is fascinating, by the way. Because what did we just get done talking about in Acts chapter 15? That you don't have to circumcise. And the very next day, this brother is circumcising Timothy. Your homework is to figure out why did he do that. No, you can't come back and say it's because he's a hypocrite. There's a reason for it. And not only am I short on time, but it's your homework. Why did this brother get Paul or get Timothy circumcised? Fascinating. It's just awesome. But this young man, Timothy, and we know he's young because one of the verses from this week was, don't let them look down upon your youth. We know Timothy's a young man. And this young man is able to breathe this life into Paul so that he can run even hotter. And when Paul's running really hot and we got Timothy is this new conversion and we got all this stuff going for us, we can be strengthened by those conversions. And it says that the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. And the conversions come upon conversions. And we see people coming to know Jesus and we see this happening and they're so excited. This time of church ought to be exciting, wonderful, encouraging, uplifting. It ought to recharge your batteries. It ought to do something for you. It ought to draw you here like a moth to a light. And if it doesn't, I have one question for you. Let me recite to you the 25th letter of the alphabet. Why? Why does it not encourage you? Why does it not draw you like a moth to a light? Because it should. It's supposed to. It's designed to. And its designer is God himself. So it ought to encourage you, just as you ought to be encouraged right now, sitting here listening to these words from the book of Acts. And I hope that you are encouraged and you keep moving forward. Let's pray.